everybody and welcome back to Landlord Law TV. I'm Tessa Shepperson and this is Ben Reeve Lewis. Today we're going to be talking about homelessness issues and we're going to start off as usual with a question and the question this time is from Felix in Southampton. Felix says I gave my tenant a section 21 notice and she took it to the homelessness unit but they told her to wait until I've got a bailiff's warrant. Trouble is, I've sold the house and I'm ready to exchange contracts. Help! <laughs> <laughs> help indeed, Felix, yes. Felix, Felix. Bad news, Felix. Yes. Sorry, we haven't got a lot of help for you. No, expecting the homelessness unit to um, rehouse people when you've served a Section 21 is a bit of a fool's errand. And I've got involved in loads of cases down the years where the landlord is simply, they want to sell the house, they serve the Section 21, and then they think the council are just going to step in and make it all okay. And then they go ahead with the sale, they've got this exchange date, it's all going to go through, and then at the last minute, the solicitors get involved, can't go through because you've still got a tenant in there. Often the tenants say they're going to go. Because they don't know. <laughs> they say, oh yes, that's all right, I'll move out. Yeah. And then they go down to the homelessness unit and the homelessness unit says, stay there until we've found somewhere for you to move to. Mm. And uh, often they won't find anywhere until they've the landlord's got a... a, a possession order and sometimes not until they've got a bailiff's appointment. Yeah, that's it. Uh, local authorities are under a statutory duty to deal with homeless people, but for many, many years now the, the emphasis in homelessness work is on what they call homelessness prevention. Um, when you get the homelessness unit written above the door of the office, I sometimes think it should be say, so you think you're homeless, because that's what's going to happen. Or maybe there should be a lifetime working model of Brian Blessed just laughing inside maybe, the doorway. Maybe, maybe, yes. Um, well, what's the reason for it? There, there, are, there are good, sound legal reasons for this. And I have to say, you're going to get a different version of wherever you go in the country. There are over 300 local authorities in Britain. If you go to Northumberland or Cornwall, then the, the pressures on property isn't so heavy. Yeah. In inner city areas, I mean, I spent many, many years working for the London Borough of Lewisham, um, which is an inner city, very poor, deprived area. And people take tickets in there, so you know exactly how many people come through in a week. And on average, we used to get 500 people a week through there, all brandished in a Section 21, all wanting a council house, as they say. And mm. um, if we picked up everyone on a Section 21, we'd run out of temporary accommodation by Tuesday afternoon. It's just not realistic. Well, I mean, all the council houses have been sold off anyway, aren't yes. they? Under Mrs. Thatcher's right to buy. So That's local right. authorities simply don't have the properties available yeah. to put people in. That's it, completely. But the, the legal side of it, uh, and there's a lot of confusion about this, landlords latch on to things. And, and, I know what they're talking about, but they kind of misunderstand how it works. You basically, you've got statute which governs who is actually homeless, and I'll talk about that in a second. You've got a raft of case law as well that comes into it. It's a huge amount of case law when it comes to uh, homelessness decisions. And sitting right in the middle is a thing called the Homelessness Code of Guidance. And it does what it says on the tin. It's just a code of guidance. It's not a law. And that's the thing that the landlords will throw back at you sometimes. Now, the first thing is the definition of homelessness under Part 7 of the Housing Act 1996. You don't have to be street homeless in order to be homeless. But the council have got a duty to people who are statutorily homeless. Now, one of the categories is that you're homeless if you've got nowhere in the world with a, a legal right to occupy. Now, mm. serving a Section 21 doesn't end your legal right to occupy. No, it doesn't. You've still got a tenancy, yeah. and the, the tenant is still legally entitled to stay there until the bailiff comes out and physically turfs them out, yeah. which could be about six months after you served that Section 21 notice. Absolutely. So, and about three months after the uh, landlord's uh, date for exchange of contracts. Yeah, which is, yeah <laughs> that's the problem that you get. Um, so on the one hand, you've got the fact that they're not actually homeless at that point. Yeah. Now, this is where the Homelessness Code of Guidance kicks in. I've been teaching this for years. It's paragraph 8.32 right. of the Homelessness Code of Guidance. I don't even have to look it up now. Um, and what it says in there is that if a landlord has served a Section 21 and intends to actually go for possession, in other words, it's not just a warning thing or it's not just been served willy-nilly, um, then the, it's unreasonable for the tenant to stay beyond the date in the Section 21. But this is the code of guidance. It's not a law. Mm. It's convenient and it's useful. And it acknowledges the idea that, well, what's the point? A, a tenant generally can't defend it. So if it's got to go through, you're putting both the tenant and the landlord through the costs of a court case that can't be defended. So that, that's the, the thinking behind it. And I have to say, a couple of years ago, I went to train the homelessness unit on the edge of Bristol, just in the, uh, the, the fields around there. And they always picked people up on the Section 21 because they didn't have the same demand and they had 
attractive places mm. that they could, the affordable places that they could put people. But what so, about this issue of um, voluntarily making yourself homeless? Intentional homelessness. Yes. Yeah, yeah, IH decisions. It's, it's a bit of a misnomer and councils can be guilty of this sometimes of saying if you move out before the landlord gets possession, you'll be found intentionally homeless and you'll be sent packing. Mm. But it's, it's, that's a too simplistic an argument to say that. There are a lot of other reasons why a person might give up accommodation that wouldn't necessarily make you intentionally homeless. There's a lot of get out of jail free cards on that one. Mm. So it's, and councils are a bit guilty of making rash um, decisions and giving rash advice like that. Um, but so you've got that in the inner city areas where the pressure's on, you've got to find it very difficult to get a homelessness unit who are able to pick up on the section 21. Um, the other thing is a bit of case law called Croydon versus Jarvis, 1994 mm -hmm. I think it is. And in that situation, the landlord challenged the council and said, you shouldn't be waiting all this long, you shouldn't be requiring me to go and get a bailiff's warrant. But the court actually sided with the council. And the reason they did so is the council, in making their decision, they showed that they had regard to three factors. Factor one was that they had regard to the tenant's position in terms of having a cost lodge against them and being able to, not being able to defend it. Mm -hmm. um, they showed that they had the uh, account of the landlord's position in terms of taking action when it was a done deal and it was never going to be defendable. And also, and this crucially, they showed that they had regard to the council's own position mm. in terms of resources and available accommodation. Mm. And because they'd considered all three of those things, they were entitled to reach a decision that they wouldn't pick up on the section 21. Um, that's a, a crucial piece of case to under, uh, a bit of law to understand. If, if they'd said we've had regard to the tenant's position and we've had the, regard to the landlord's position but not the council's position, it may not have stood. It was a real belt mm. and braces thing. They just had to show that they did that. And that's the thinking that rules inner city authorities when it comes to picking people up. The, the suggestion that it's unreasonable to remain after the section 21 is in the code of guidance. It's not in the it's statute. Not law, yeah. Not in, not in case law, yeah. So if you're a landlord and you want to sell your property, um, you need to start your proceedings for possession as soon as you possibly can. Absolutely. You're not going to do anybody any favours by giving the tenant more time in the property because it's just going to delay the time that the local authority be, will rehouse them. So you need to serve yeah. your Section 21 notice. As soon as the notice has expired, you need to issue your proceedings. You so need to follow them all the way through. And then, um, and then you need to get the bailiff's appointment at the end. Normally, the local authority um, will ensure, well, almost invariably, the local authority will ensure that the tenant is moved out um, before the bailiffs come round. If, of course, they're in priority need. Of course, not all tenants are entitled to be rehoused. Well, it's only those thing. in priority <coughs> need. Yeah. So, um, I mean, if they're not in priority need, then you may have to have them evicted by the bailiffs. Yeah, priority need is where you've got children under 18, uh, you're pregnant, you've got some sort of health problems, those kind of things. Or if single there's been person. an emergency. Yeah, emergency. If it's a single person, then um, they're not going to get rehoused no. anyway. And the key thing, you mentioned it earlier on, is if you're a landlord and you serve your Section 21, you want to sell the property and your tenant goes, that's okay, I'll go down the council. The tenants often get this wrong as well. Always do it, just follow it. It's going to cost you a few hundred pounds, for sure. But what's it going to cost you if your sale is all called off at the Well, absolutely, thing? yes. And the trouble is, is if you, if you exchange contracts when you haven't got vacant possession, mm. that's going to put you in a really difficult position because the, um, the purchaser um, is entitled to, to enforce the, the, the purchase, but you're not going to be able to give them with the thing that you've contracted to give them, which is vacant possession, yeah. um, so that the purchaser can claim compensation off you. And I've known a case where that actually happened. Um, so you, you need to be really careful about it. You never, never, never exchange contracts until you've got vacant possession. Do not trust your tenant to move out. It may be on, be on their part to move out because yeah. if they've been told by the council they've got to stay there and they're not yeah. going to be rehoused, exactly. they're not going to move out. Yeah. So um, always do that. It, it's, it's against the law. Once you've got possession, then the tenant will be under threat of homelessness within the next 28 days. Mm. That's one of the categories of homelessness. So they can still wait for the warrant, but they, the council have to open a homeless case at that point yeah. and not just wait until the warrant comes through, um, although sometimes it happens. So the moral of the story is if you're going to sell your house, be prepared to spend six or seven hundred pounds evicting your tenant. Don't do the section 21 and then keep your fingers crossed. It won't happen. Absolutely yeah. not. Okay, right. Well, thank you very much for watching. Um, we'll be back next time with another question on another topic. We'll see you then. Hello, this is Tessa Shepherson, and today I'm interviewing Giles Pika 
Giles is a solicitor and partner at Anthony Gold and the creator of the marvellous Nearly Legal blog. Giles, I can remember when you set up Nearly Legal. It was um, just a couple of months after I set up my blog. What were your reasons for starting a blog at that time? Uh, at the time I was a paralegal and uh, just finding my way into, uh, into practice, let alone housing law, and it was originally just somewhere to put things that interested me. Mm. Um, anonymous, because as you'll remember at that time, there were very few law blogs around and nobody quite knew how people would react to them. But uh, yeah, originally it was just somewhere to put uh, reflections on legal practice. Yes, that was, that was why I did mine. Um, at that time, as you said, you were, you were a trainee and um, now you're a partner at, at Anthony Gold. Mm. Do you think the blog's helped you on that journey? Uh, yes, uh, it has, I think, yeah, in a couple of ways. And the first is it's a continual education and my, my memory store yes. <laughs> yes. For, for, for practice. It, it saves me actually having to remember most of the cases as long as I remember that I wrote about it. You <laughs> But I think certainly once I, I, I came out, as it were, which I think was about 2008, mm -hmm. um, by which time the blog was already, I think, pretty well regarded, um, yeah, it, it certainly helped to be known as, as, as being behind the blog, yes. Yes, so um, the blog's very different now to what it was in 2006. Mm -hmm. How has it changed over time? Uh, there's an awful lot more of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think, I, mean, I think there's about 1,500 case reports in there now, but um, I think it's become more and more increasingly focused on, on doing a, a job. Yes, of, of so, so it's, it's a case report. Primarily, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, um, and updates on, on, on statutes and so on. I think it's become much more focused on, on that. It's been, um, it's been other bits added, I think the whole um, sort of bedroom tax thing, yes. which nobody else was doing. Yes. Um, and somehow, almost accidentally, I ended up sort of collecting them and reporting on the, the bedroom tax decisions and that became a whole sort of separate set and a whole new audience as well, mm. as to be said, a lot of people doing their own tribunals. Um, and of course, you know, as you know, there's, there's, uh, it started with just me, but now there's quite a lot of other people writing as well. Yes, I mean, I remember at one stage you were thinking about closing the blog because it was getting a bit much. Yes. Um, can, you, can you discuss what happened then and how you moved to the current situation where you've got several writers on the blog? Um, yes, well, I, I, I was just running out of time. Uh, mm. I think it was shortly before I qualified. Uh, yes, it must have been shortly before I qualified. I was just running out of time to do it. Um, so... <laughs> Literally, I put a call out on the blog saying, <laughs> does anybody else want to write for it? <laughs> and lo and behold, another four or five people, uh, solicitors and barristers, came forward. And um, most of them are still still mm. writing for it. So at that point, yes, it became a, a thankfully, it became a team effort. That was excellent. Um, so, we've been talking about, what, what do you think is the main purpose of the blog? Who are its readers? And... Um, is it true you've been cited in, um, in, in court cases as an authority? <laughs> right, uh, well the purpose of the blog I think is now, as I said, very much focused on, on uh, being a place for information and discussion of, of, of housing law and specifically uh, case, case law and case reports updated statute. The audience well, frankly continually surprises me. Uh, I, I, well, now you find out who's reading, it's a constant surprise. Um, in my less modest moments, I say everybody reads it, yeah. or at least virtually everybody involved in in the uh, the housing sector. We have local what are the stats then? Uh, we're currently getting about forty five thousand views a month, mm -hmm. which, given that the housing law world is not a large, that's not world, bad, yeah. Um, and I know who email updates are going out to, and it's everybody from central government to local authorities, housing associations, obviously solicitors and, mm -hmm. and, and barristers, homeless officers. I mean, it's, Judges? It's a few. That's yes. nice. That's uh, <laughs> a, a few on the, on the, on, on the mailing list. Um, there are rumours. Uh, and they're mostly county court, but there are rumours that sometimes high court judges come to uh, to uh, check their write-ups, <laughs> apparently. Um, uh, but yes, the, the citation in court, that has happened. Uh -huh. 
I, I pity the people who did it. Uh, <laughs> Nonsense. But, well, we're not an authority, and we're not a we're not a record. But there was a point after a, uh, a very significant homeless judgment came out back in two thousand and ten, something like that. Uh, no, sorry, it wasn't the homeless judgment. It was it was Pinnock. It was the great proportionality decisions, and the actual we uh, wrote up the report. Uh, from uh, from a judgment before the judgment actually appeared on Bailey, mm -hmm. and apparently as people were taking the print out of our report into, <laughs> into court, into yeah. court. I'm not sure how well that went, but yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's uh, it's better than nothing. Yeah, no, true. It reminds me very much of how the original case reporting started, because mm. often they were amateur people who were just writing up reports, and then they morphed into the traditional case reports that we have. So, I mean, it's yeah. a similar sort of thing, isn't it? Yes, although thankfully we have Bailey and, and, and so on to actually rely on for the judgments, but uh, in the sense of uh, distilling the judgments and offering comment on them, yeah, mm. very, very similar. And I think, uh, I mean, as you know, with, with Landlord Law Blog, I think you know, the freedom to be able to comment like that um, it's easily wonderful. is, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. wonderful. Yes, yeah, so the internet is, internet is marvellous. Um, you have several um, writers. How do you decide amongst yourselves what to write? Uh, well, technically, I'm editor in chief. Um, there is a they've got an email circle, and usually it's just they get sent round and people volunteer. Mm. If people don't volunteer, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> or I suggest that somebody volunteers, one of the yeah. two. Um, but you, normally, it's not a problem. We have got a bit of a backlog at the moment, but we're working through it. So do you try and report on all the cases that come out in, in housing law? and? We pride it's ourselves on having every significant judgment since 2008 and also breaking news of particularly county court judgments that aren't binding but are of interest to mm. in the tenancy deposit. Yeah, ones. absolutely, yeah. Uh, and you know, people send us those. Yeah, that's um, good. So I, I, I think... Okay, we are a bit, little bit behind. There's about <laughs> five cases still to do, but otherwise, you know, I think we, we pride ourselves on our, our completeness. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of cases in the social housing sector, mm -hmm, awful mm. lot of cases, so it must take some doing keeping up with it all. It does, yes. Yes. Um, I mean, it looks in the blog as if you probably do the majority of the writing, is that right? How, mm, is that yes. just, how do you find the time? Uh, I probably do just over half, I suppose, or possibly slightly more. Um, how I find the time is, is, is I don't know, <laughs> bluntly. <laughs> uh, I, I suspect my family aren't pleased, but uh, yeah, I, you know, it, it is a struggle sometimes, but um, I suppose we end up with a strange sense of duty because there's so many people reading the, reading the thing now that you know, you actually got to get it done. But, I write um, a post every morning. Mm. I, I do. It's the first thing. It's part of my morning routine. I make the blog post live, but uh, mine's a different sort of blog from yours. So. Yeah. No. I, I'd. I'd. Uh, I'd like to do that, but I, I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't mind a spell of three or four days without something, but uh, then they tend to come in second fast. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. it's not all it. Are there any episodes on the blog or posts on the blog or, or things that you're particularly proud of? <laughs> um, I love the one, oh truck, that's my favourite. <laughs> that's my absolute favourite on the blog. Unfortunately, some people still believe that I am traumatically scarred by, chick by chickens. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, well, there, there's a couple like that. I was Personally, I was rather fond of the, uh, the uh, Northumbrian uh, uh, Asbo breach uh, for, for uh, disturbing the neighbours in peculiar ways, um, yes. which was, it was entertaining to write, or indeed the, uh, the, uh, the hot tub, noisy hot tub, mm -hmm. uh, uh, noise nuisance case. Uh, I think in terms of legal commentary, I'm particularly proud of our group posts around the uh, Pinnock proportionality Article 8 decisions, mm -hmm. which actually pulled together virtually everybody who was writing for the blog at that time in a sort of epic comment on this incredibly important case. Uh, and I think in terms of legal writing, that was probably one of our one of our finest. Mm. Okay. Um, generally, as you've been writing about housing law for such a long time, have you noticed any sort of themes developing? And, and how do you think things are going? Do you have any predictions for the way housing law is going? I mean, you must get a sense of... Um, yes. I think it's... It's gone in two directions. I think in terms of social housing 
it's become sort of more and more settled. The cases tend to be a little bit around the edges. Some exceptions, the recent Johnson Hotak Kanu Supreme Court case on homelessness being a, a big one. Um, but it, it, social housing law tends to be sort of, you know, technical bits around the edges. Principles are pretty much settled. A lot of the action, I suppose, in legal terms, seems to have moved to the private sector, mm. uh, particularly with the deposit. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Which has been a roller coaster of a sum. Given me a lot to write about. <laughs> <laughs> no, quite, and indeed us. Um, and one suspects, given what seems to be coming down the line, yes. that there's going to be an awful lot more. Immigration. Immigration, the further road landlord provisions, although it now looks like a road landlord is going to be someone who doesn't evict a tenant without notice. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An unusual. It's, yeah. It's who would have thought? Quite, indeed. Uh, but in, I think it looks like there's going to be some fairly fundamental rewriting of, of, uh, of private sector housing law going on. So, Interesting times. Yeah, very. So, just to wrap up, what do you think is the future of the blog? Do you think it's going to be more of the same, or do you have any other plans for, for developing it? Um, I keep toying with things. Time is the big problem. Yes. Um, I would like to... I tried to turn our archives into e-books, mm -hmm. uh, which has sort of worked up to a point, but again, that needs constant topping up. I'm not sure I've got the time. Uh, I'd like to refine that, if possible. Uh, we're toying with video. Mm-hmm not done it yet but I'm toying with video um, and I think yeah, I do think we've, we've got such a wealth of material there that there's actually got to be other ways to to use that or to make it uh, useful for people and there probably is a maybe a, a printed book in there maybe although of course a lot of it's the you know, constantly superseded so a lot of the right, early yeah. materials out of date and some of it isn't but, um, Possibly. Uh, so far, nobody's approached us with large, large sums of money. So. Oh, shame. Well, maybe this is your chance if you're a publisher. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for giving up your time, Giles. And uh, you will find the Nearly Legal blog at www.nearlylegal.co.uk. Thank you very much. <laughs>